John Jose from the University of Miami, Division of Musculoskeletal Radiology. For the next few minutes, we're going to be discussing basic MRI anatomy of the elbow. This is intended as a tutorial for junior residents and medical students. So this is a coronal proton density image. We're starting posteriorly. We see the proximal ulna and the olecranon process. As we extend more anteriorly, we see the coronoid process of the ulna and we start seeing portions of the radial head. This is the distal humerus. This round uh, structure that we catch on our coronal images is the olecranon fossa. That's where the uh, posterior tip of the olecranon will kind of articulate with the distal humerus. This is a medial or internal epicondyle. This is the lateral or external epicondyle. This is pseudo defect of the capitellum which lies posteriorly as we extend more anteriorly we see the articular surface of the capitellum medially we see the trochlear and again here is that coronoid process of the proximal ulna with regards to the proximal radius this is the radial head this is the radial neck this is the radial tuberosity which will be the site of attachment of the uh, biceps tendon In the proximal ulna, we have a portion of the proximal ulna that is known as the sublime tubercle, and this is where the ulnar collateral ligament, the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament, will attach. There are three main articulations of the elbow. We have the proximal radial ulnar articulation here, we have the radial capitellar articulation, and then we have the ulnar humeral articulation. Now, and starting from posterior to anterior, our major tendons are going to be the triceps tendon, which we'll see better on our sagittal images. Laterally, we'll see our common extensor tendon at its origin. Medially, we'll see the common flexor tendon at its origin in portions of the pronator. And then as we extend more anteriorly, we see the biceps brachii inserting into that radial tuberosity. And we also catch the brachialis inserting into the ulnar tuberosity. We'll, we'll kind of go over that in a few seconds. This muscle out here is the brachioradialis. And then you have a muscle that kind of surrounds the radial neck and, and, and proximal diaphysis. This is the supinator muscle. In terms of our ligamentous anatomy on our coronal images, medially we're going to see this structure here extending from that inferior margin of the medial epicondyle of distal humerus towards the sublime tubercle. And this is the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. The ulnar collateral ligament has three bundles. There's an anterior bundle, a posterior bundle, and a transverse bundle. The bundle that we see to advantage on our coronal MR images is this, which is the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. On the lateral side and posteriorly, we see this structure here which extends from the posterior margin of the uh, distal humerus and extends posteriorly along the radial head and neck to insert on the lateral border of the uh, proximal ulna and this is known as the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. It's a very important ligament for stability of the radial head. If you have deficiencies in the lateral ulnar collateral ligament you may get something called posterior lateral rotatory instability of the radial head. As you go from posterior to anterior, we then see this structure here, which is the radial collateral ligament. Radial collateral ligament, which is more anterior. Now, oftentimes, you may see a small triangular piece of tissue along the lateral or posterior lateral border of the radial capitellar articulation, and these are just synovial plicae uh, that can be present in this location, and if they're enlarged, they can lead to impingement. And finally, uh, major neurovascular bundles that we catch within our field of view. Uh, traveling posterior medially, we see portions of the ulnar nerve that will travel in the cubital tunnel, which lies posterior to the medial epicondyle of the distal humor. So we'll review that in a, in a few minutes. Covering our sagittal images, we're along the far lateral border. We catch portions of the brachioradialis. We're seeing portions of the triceps and portions of the biceps breaking. But as we see, uh, starting again with osseous anatomy, we have that lateral epicondyle of the distal 
humerus and we see portions of the radial head and neck. So we are catching the common extensor tendon here. As we extend more medially, we start seeing the articular surface of the capitellum. And again, we have that normal bare area along the posterior margin, the pseudo defect, posterior margin of the capitellum. And here's that articular surface of the radial head and the radial neck. And then as we extend more medially, we start seeing the olecranon process of the proximal ulna and then that anterior border being the coronoid process. We nicely see both fossa of the distal humerus. This is the olecranon fossa where that dorsal tip of the olecranon will, will engage in elbow extension. And then when this is the coronoid fossa of the distal humerus and this in the elbow flexion, the, the coronoid process will, will engage there. And these are common areas of intraarticular body displacement. So we have to uh, be careful to uh, to evaluate those. We nicely see the posterior and anterior fat pads of the elbow. This patient does not have much of an effusion, so they're not distended out. Attaching uh, posteriorly on the uh, olecranon process, we see the, the triceps. Now the triceps will be made up of three main heads, the medial, the lateral, and the long head of the triceps. So the more anterior insertion which actually has a direct muscle insertion into bone. This is the medial head of the triceps. And then posteriorly, we have a long tendon insertion of the lateral and the long heads. And what happens is you can have a full thickness tear of either the tendon and or the muscle attachments, and you're not going to have much tendon retraction because the other head will still be in uh, intact. So only when you have complete full thickness avulsion of the tricep involving both the direct muscular attachment of the medial head as well as the long tendon attachment which is more posterior of the lateral and the long heads that you'll have um, uh, some degree of significant retraction. Then extending more medially we start catching portions of the uh, uh, biceps which are basically not seen to advantage here but there is the insertion in, uh, along the medial aspect of the radial tuberosity. And then here is brachialis coming down, attaching into that ulnar tuberosity and the sagittal views. And then as we extend more uh, along the medial aspect, we see the uh, flexor uh, tendon at the origin and portions of the pronator. Now in terms of the ligamentous anatomy, the sagittal images are useful in helping us distinguish the radial collateral ligament and the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. So on our sagittal images, the radial collateral ligament will extend anteriorly while the lateral ulnar collateral ligament will extend posteriorly. And so this is the common extensor tendon at the origin. And as we go from medial to lateral, we see that radial collateral ligament here. But then we nicely see the lateral ulnar collateral ligament kind of wrapping around and heading towards the ulna right there. And on the far medial margin, deep to the common flexor pronator tendon, we start seeing some fibers of the ulnar collateral ligament. Now the problem is that we, cat, we don't catch them very well, so we, it's best to evaluate the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament on our coronal images and the posterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament on axial images. So here are the uh, axial proton density images. Let's review again the uh, regional osteology. So we're getting into the area, this is the uh, capitellum, the lateral epicondyle will be here, the medial epicondyle will be here, this is the olecranon process of the proximal ulna, this is the ulnohumeral articulation. As we extend more distally, we see portions of the coronoid process, we also catch uh, the radial head, this is the proximal radial ulnar joint, which is stabilized by this ligamentous structure, which we best evaluate on the axial images, and this is called the anterior ligament. The anterior ligament will stabilize the radial head at the proximal radial ulnar joint. And you can see that proximal radial ulnar joint is nicely covered by articular cartilage, this gray structure that we see here. On the, uh, as we continue further uh, inferiorly, we're still seeing two tuberosities. This is the radial tuberosity, which is where the biceps will insert. And then this is the ulnar tuberosity, which is where the brachialis tendon were insert. Now, reviewing the major tendons, starting from anterior to posterior, this is the biceps brachii. The biceps brachii will extend inferiorly and will insert on that radial tuberosity. The biceps being an important flexor and supinator 
uh, muscle. The flexor of the elbow, supinator of the hand and wrist. Now, just proximal uh, to its insertion, a few centimeters above the level of the radial tuberosity, we'll find this thin strip of tissue that covers the biceps tendon and it will extend medially to kind of cover the pronator muscle, which is here. And this is the Lacertus fibrosis, also known as the bicipital aponeurosis. If you have tears of the uh, biceps tendon distally, the Lacertus fibrosis may or may not be injured. And if it's intact, the torn biceps tendon may not retract uh, proximally, and that may make it uh, clinically challenging to diagnose. Uh, high-grade biceps tears if the Lacerta fibrosis is intact. So here's the Lacerta fibrosis. Um, as we extend more posteriorly, we see the next major muscle here, which will follow down and insert into that ulnar tuberosity. This is the brachialis uh, muscle and its tendon. Along the lateral aspect, we'll see this major uh, muscle here. This is the brachioradialis. The brachioradialis will start laterally along the lateral supracondylar ridge of the distal humerus and it will extend distally to insert towards the base of the radiostylar process along the lateral aspect of the wrist so break your radialis along the medial margin we will see the pronator teres the pronator teres has two heads uh, a humeral head and an ulnar head uh, we also see the common flexor tendon uh, near that internal or medial epicondyle so we commonly refer to this as the common pronator flexor origin. There is the median nerve traveling between the two heads of the pronator teres. Along the lateral margin, we see the common extensor tendon at its origin there. Uh, and as you extend more distally, we further subdivide. We also see another muscle kind of enclosing or circling the uh, proximal radius. This is the supinator muscle here. Along the far posterior margin, we see our triceps muscle. And again, we see the medial head kind of forming that anterior direct muscular attachment to the olecranon, while the long and lateral heads will come in uh, and insert into that long tendon attachment directly onto the bone. Posterior laterally, we have this muscle, which is the ancaneus. And um, medially, we see as we extend distally, this is the area of the cubital tunnel. Now the cubital tunnel, the floor of the cubital tunnel, will be made up by this structure, which is the posterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. So we see that structure best on axial images. The roof of the cubital tunnel will be made by this, which is Osborne's fascia or Osborne's ligament. And these two, the Osborne's ligament and the posterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament, will help to stabilize the ulnar nerve at the level of the cubital tunnel. If you have disruption of Osborne's ligament, what may happen is that the ulnar nerve may subluxate medially uh, along that medial epicondyle. To finish up with the nerves traveling anterior laterally, this is the radial nerve, and as it extends distally, it'll throw a small branch. Uh, laterally, this is called the posterior interosseous nerve. The posterior interosseous nerve will travel right next to the supinator and, and, and may pierce portions of the supinator muscle as we can see there. That's the posterior interosseous nerve. An entrapment of the posterior interosseous nerve may present with uh, lateral elbow pain and mimic lateral epicondylitis. And then finally, as we previously mentioned, the median nerve traveling between the brachialis and the two heads of the pronator as it extends distally, uh, we can follow nicely the median nerve.